Oh, yep, just definitely hit a car. Okay, uh, yeah, so I don't know really where I'm driving whatsoever. There's actually a GPS over there that tells me I'm, I think I'm going the wrong way. Oh, this is, <laughs> steering is a little sensitive here. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Bad Ideas Garage. I'm sitting in a 1992 Freightliner. Um, this is a simulator though, and I've been volunteering at the Pacific Northwest Truck Museum in Brooks, Oregon at Powerland. Um, set of museums and I'm in the simulator and so I'm going to be working on it today and that's what our video is all about is putting together the simulator that was given to the museum and I'm doing a little bit of upgrades. Hey everyone and welcome to our podcast Caution Wide Right. It's just another trucking podcast and I'm Luke your host. Today we're going to talk about an old 1992 Freightliner semi-truck turned simulator that's been sitting at an old Oregon museum that needed a lot of tender love and care so it can basically run the simu uh, the truck driving simulator again to talk about this project I have Stephen Hodges not only not only a friend of mine from college but a man of many skills a serial entrepreneur marketing expert program manager uh, for student engagement for the College of Business at Oregon State University and a teacher um, teaching business classes, entrepreneurship, and also mechanic with his own YouTube channel, Bad Ideas Garage, where among loving cars and doing ridiculous things with them, has had a project fixing this old truck driving simulator at the Pacific Northwest Truck Museum outside Salem, Oregon. Steven, welcome to the podcast. That was a, a rousing introduction to make me feel like a lot bigger of a deal than I really am, I feel. So thank you very much, Luke. It's good to see your face again after, I, I, I'm pretty sure the last time I saw you was like in 2010. Yeah, it's, that's over a decade, so. Thanks Mark Zuck that we got to ha hang out on social media a lot and keep track, uh, keep that's... trucking, keep track. There we go. There's my auto, uh, my auto correct uh, already not working this morning because it's very early here on the West Coast. Well, keep trucking, that is actually an ELD provider for, uh, for telematic device for a truck so there you go maybe you know what you're talking about in the trucking industry <laughs> well maybe like and subscribe below for somebody who has no idea what they're doing whatsoever but we'll bring some mild entertainment but yeah so with an introduction like that how about you give everybody a rundown of what a typical day-to-day -day or week looks like amongst the various projects i know school uh oregon state's about to start classes soon so what does that look like oh geez okay so uh we start in the west well, in Oregon, we start really late. Um, so I still have a couple more weeks before I start teaching class. Um, it's the very end of September and beginning of October is when we start teaching. And my title is all weird. Effectively, what I do is I teach small business courses. We took the big BA 101 course, broke it apart. And, um, and actually in the building where we lived, Luke, back in the day, um, that, that, that classroom where I took classes, I now teach in that classroom. And so the introduction yep. to business course, it's, it's a, basically a how to college course to start. What do I want to do with my life? And then we put students into teams, they start businesses. And then throughout the course of the year, again, I have, I have very small classes. They're like 30 to 35. I get to know them really well. I get to mentor them and tell them yeah. things like stop. You know, I can, I can tell them after building the relationship, stop being lazy, or maybe you should not do that. Um, and they, they build businesses and we have about 750 students. Last year, we made about $85,000 in our student businesses. So they get the practical hands-on experience. And then they also do the academic side. Um, you know, we have midterms and such that we get to do. So that is a really big change that comes. And over the summer, it's a little bit different. I get to kind of step up things with my business. So we build websites for all sorts of different types of companies. Um, we do things like integrations with dropship providers. So uh, I worked on that earlier this summer uh, for actually one of my own projects. Um, there's a subscription service uh, webpage that I just recently built. And then I do get to give back. And I, over the summer, spent a lot of time at uh, Powerland Heritage Park. So just like you said, uh, it's north of Salem, Oregon, if you're in the area, marketing what that whole organization is. It's 14 wonderful museums, including an awesome truck museum, uh, yep. which is adjacent to the fire museum uh, where I'm a board member. So I'm a volunteer at the truck museum and a couple of the other museums, I guess, if I had a title, but I'm at the fire museum 
And we share a lot of carryover because we also have our own large vehicles and there's a lot of carryover between, oh, there's that diesel engine, there's that diesel engine. We both know Caterpillar makes it, ha ha ha, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then I'm a father, you know, I'm a father and a husband. So I spend uh, a crazy amounts of time with my kids um, and I absolutely love it. And they're, they're starting to get old enough to be able to do some of these projects with me yeah. Um, yeah. rather than we have to go get childcare so I can go try this X, Y, and Z. So I just film a lot of those antics and a lot of the silly things that I see around the mid Willamette Valley of Oregon, put them on a YouTube channel. I don't promise any sort of quality content whatsoever, <laughs> but you will be mildly entertained. And we have some fun trips that we do go on, like the Gambler 500, which is a whole nother thing. And I have a couple of my own projects that I'm working on. It's really a smorgasbord. I wish that I had a more succinct dancer. That's exactly what I expected though. So that's awesome. And as a, I mean, I guess you're obviously new to the trucking industry, sort of maybe getting some faces uh, and, and talking to some people, but I have some quick fire questions to see uh, maybe some of your thoughts and see how much, uh, I, I guess, you know, sort of the noob of uh, your, your trucking knowledge. So we'll start with some very quick ones. Uh, what do you grab from a truck stop for snacks when on a road trip? What do I grab from a truck stop? When I'm on a road trip, I'd probably find if if the truck stop had some sort of restaurant, I would I would grab something from that restaurant rather than grabbing any of the snacks. I'd try to make it some whatever it is. So you know, a lot of them have subways and stuff like that. Oh, uh, yeah. That's what, that's what I'd go to because I I hate to say it, but all the like snacky foods just do a number <laughs> on my gut. Uh, and that's so true in the trucking world too. Uh, the 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 health the health healthy eating while on the road is uh, it's a tough one. I can't imagine. Again, I'm so underqualified to answer these questions because I'm like, oh, the heaviest thing I've ever hauled was like a 13,000 pound classroom. Like, and people listening to this are gonna be like, but, you know, yep. uh, and when I was on there, it's like Subway, Taco Bell, you know, try to get something that at least has some like green things in it known as vegetables. Like th that's what I try to go for. <laughs> All right, how about best caffeine for the road? Best. Oh, I'm black coffee, black coffee. I'm just, I'm just a very normal black coffee. And if I do have to go for the good stuff, uh, uh, just the OG Red Bull. Have you ever peed in a cup while driving on a road trip? Yes. <laughs> All right. How about what is, what is a low boy? Uh, you might actually know this one. Yeah. So, uh, we use low boys to move, uh, like buildings and stuff. Um, so we, we've done that before, uh, where we had to move buildings. And then some of our uh, fire apparatus, it's just easier to get them onto a low boy. Um, and then at the truck show, the um, Rick Franklin Trucking, which is a company out here, they have this really cool setup of low boys. And it was really cool. I got to, I got to show my kid what a low boy was. And he was able to be like, oh, I'm on it. Because it was you know that far yeah. off the ground. It was really cool. Yeah, awesome. Uh, have you ever seen the movie Space Truckers from the 80s? Oh gosh, only only short sections as parts of memes and hilarious. I highly recommend it because it's good. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is, this and and honestly, I don't think anybody in the trucking world has actually seen it, but I've been pushing it on this channel for uh, a while now, and I'm going to continue to push it. But how about this? How about a favorite movie with a semi truck in it? Uh, a favorite movie with a semi truck. It, it could be a trucking movie. It could be. I, I won't give any hints. There's a couple that I, come to mind, but. Uh, the movie Cars, which is the, one of the best movie of all time, Mac. Yep, Mac, and you got you got Mater for the tow truck that works. Yeah. I I think of I think of uh, the Matrix, um, the second one where they're on the highway on top of the trucks, and then uh, I think of oh, what's the other one? I mean, you can you, Fast and Furious where they're going underneath the trucks, things like that. It's just like yeah. Um, okay, uh, you might have a CB handle or a CB radio, but if you had a CB handle, what would your CB handle name be? Uh, Boss AI. I love it. Uh, what is a road gator? A road gator? I have no idea. I know what a right, John you, Deere gator is. I ride those all the time. You see him on the road all the time. I need to, you got to give it. You got to give a guess. Road gator. See him on the roads all the time. Uh, is it is it like the the height and weight checker before you go through a scale? Nope, it's exploded tires. So you stop at the scale when you're legally obliged to stop at the scale. <laughs> there's there's other nicknames for that for sure, but uh, it's exploded tires on the side of the roads. Those are the road gators. Oh, that makes sense. It does. It does. 
Uh, how about what's a lot lizard and should you fall in love with one? Uh, I have a feeling a lot lizard is a truck that stays on the lot the vast majority of the time. And it's way too clean for a truck that's supposed to be in service. And no, you shouldn't fall in love with it. But now that I'm saying this, this is probably not anywhere close. A lady of the night is the uh, political answer I can say. Oh, but strangers in the night. There you go. Lances like that. That's going to be the intro to the podcast now, right there. Okay. All right. Last one uh, with EVs taking, uh, will EVs take over the trucking world? Long haul, heavy haul. Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I think that they'll probably increase in importance um, over time, but I don't think that they're going to take over. And that a lot of that's with my personal philosophy that I can talk about for a long time. I think that there's going to be an increase in importance and there's a lot of things that could be said about it. But I, it, again, it's not the sa- EV stuff is not the savior of the world. It's Jesus for the record. Uh, but I think that there's a lot to be said about EV technology that could be really helpful in a lot of applications. But at the same time, what's getting pushed on different things, I think I'm that that's what's kind of concerning to me. It's like th- you're not experts, but let's have a conversation to see what could be helpful versus, well, this is something that really, really is tried and true. Uh, the reason why you're here, tell me a little bit how you and Dale started the Bad Ideas Garage channel and what is it all about? Sure. Um, so we wanted to chronicle all of the silly things that we do with cars. And so Dale's a friend of mine from college. We all know Dale. Um, and he works with me at Oregon State. And he does a lot of stuff with Mercedes. And I actually used to work at Mercedes. So that's where the shirt is from. Um, so I, I worked at a truck manufacturing facility in Germany for Mercedes awesome. that, that owns Freightliner. Daimler owns Freightliner. Yep. Um, and so that was really my, that was actually my first foray into anything that has to do with the industry. Um, my, my parents actually or my mom worked at Freightliner here in, uh, in, in Portland, Oregon, back yeah. in the day. So that's like the closest connection um, to trucking stuff. But back to the YouTube channel, um, we wanted to chronicle the thing, the silly things that we do um, with car stuff. And part of it was also during COVID, you know, we're, we're stuck home and we're like, we, we should do this. It's because some of the stuff that we did, it's like, this is really unbelievable that we bought this car. We did that thing with it. Um, and so we bought the first car that we bought was a 2003 uh, Mercedes-Benz CL600 V12 Rentec, which is a mouthful. It, it has <laughs> it's a V12 with twin turbos. I'll, in this I'll put thing. a picture on screen or something. It, it, it's nuts how fast this car is. And it doesn't necessarily look like it. And this thing is also absolutely gigantic. It's very long. It's very wide. It's two doors. It has soft closed doors. And you get in and you're just like so relaxed. But this thing will do 200 miles an hour. Um, and, and it was stuck on the ground. And so we actually had to have some very, very talented truck drivers come, uh, help get it off the ground because it was up here. There was a driveway that went like this. And then the road went like this. And because Mercedes doesn't use bump stops on their suspension, the (laughs) hydraulic suspension had failed, which of course is under some insane amount of pressure. And so we had to basically pump it up off the ground to get it out onto one trailer that got into another trailer, but that whole, and, and that's our first episode. Um, and then from there, we just did a bunch of how-to videos and we kind of figured out where our footing was. And then I realized that this is something that can actually bring, bring a lot of blessing uh, to others. And so that's what I get to do now is that um, there's enough traction on it. You know, we have over a thousand subscribers so, and we're monetized and all that fun stuff. It's like, I don't really care about the monetization um, because I make a whole 15 bucks a month or whatever right. it is. Um, <laughs> it's, more, it's more of like, I am doing a review now because I have enough of an audience of electric cars. So that's what I'm doing later today for the new Hyundai Ionic 6. And I wanna give a very practical without like, oh, electric cars are the savior of the world. I'm like, no, I love electric cars because of all of these reasons. And here's a very practical approach to how it's a good daily driver without all of, you know, the hype about like, oh, this or or you hate it, it's just right down the middle. So that's really where we're at right now is it's like, wow, this is gonna, this is a really great car that happens to be electric rather than, oh, it's awful or it's great. It's like, you know. And your channel bio, it mentions that you do a lot of silly things with cars and things like that. I'm curious, what's one or two crazy projects you've done? So right now uh, I have a Subaru Justy, uh, which was this really odd, it kinda, it's kind of like the Geo Metro um, from the early nineties that uh, yeah. 
actually I had that in college for a very, or well, that was a, from high school. And then I had it, I worked on it the day that I got married. <laughs> I found it again. My neighbor's uncle had it. And the day before my child was born, kid number two, I went and drug it home. And then over the course of several months, uh, it now has a Honda D16 motor in it. And we have a turbo setup. So it's going to be a Honda powered Subaru um, that wow. is going to be awesome. I also have a yeah. Mercedes C43 AMG. It's a very rare car that got crushed. Let's just say it got crushed in an accident. I couldn't let it go. I put it into the Gambler 500, which is an off-road race in a Mercedes sedan. Wow. But before I did that, I cut off the part that was all crunched. So now it's a truck. So uh, here's a picture of it, right? Um, it's amazing. So I have the world's only Mercedes AMG truck that was a C-class sedan of this era that I understand that's an AMG it's V8 powered. I mean, that's stupid. That's, that's silly. And, and yeah. I have a video, a video of me chronicling that I still have my high school car. Um, there's the Subaru, there's a couple Subaru XTs that a buddy of mine owns that I'm trying to figure out how I can get this, get them restored without financially ruining me or spending too much time on them. Um, <laughs> it, it, so it, it's, it's things like that. Um, I, I brought home a $50 Honda, um, to see if I could play uh, the game of statistics and I lost the game of statistics. Uh, I slapped a timing belt on it to see if it would, if it would run after blowing the timing belt, it, and it didn't run. Uh, but, uh, the guy that was working on it with me, he got it running for like 150 bucks and just replaced a couple of valves. And now he loves it. Um, I bought a Porsche for a thousand dollars. That was a bad idea. Never, ever, 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 ever do that. Um, never got that thing right. But Every single time we got it close to running, it would flame up the intake, which was hilarious. Um, you know, things like that. Th those are the types of projects we've done recently. And then um, some of the crazier stuff, you see a lot of weird fire trucks. So we have a lot yeah. of fire trucks that come through the, the fire museum. And I get to, like, I got to work on a, a diesel that hadn't been running in like five years and trying to get that running and figure out, because fire trucks are wired up in kind of weird ways, especially things yeah. that were converted um, from production vehicles. So that's always fun to be like, hmm, what is this rat's nest? Oh, there's a real rat's nest. Oh, there's still rats in it. And then <laughs> look at the wiring that is colloquially known as a rat's nest and figure out what, right. what the hell of it is. And I again, I have no business messing around with any of it, but I'm a volunteer and I'm up there. And you know, my, my brother, thankfully, lives in Kaiser, so the cousins can play together. And yeah. I got a couple of minutes to go over there to try to figure out what's wrong. Um, we had an ambulance that had only uh, 9,000 miles on it. Um, that was spectacular to drive around. I actually sold it to a, a friend of mine in our church. So it's staying local. And this thing is, it's a long wheelbase 92. Uh, it might be one of the last vehicles that has a freaking carburetor on it. And wow. this thing was just spectacular to drive around. And my kids loved it. And it's like, who gets the opportunity to be able to go drive around in a freaking ambulance? Seriously, well, well, we we do. That's what we get to do. So it, <laughs> it, it's fun. It, it's a combination of the practical, but also fun stuff like that. So the Trek Museum. Well, I mean, uh, Power Heritage. Uh, how, what's, what's the name of it again? It's uh, Powerland Heritage Park. There Powerland we... Heritage Park. So, yeah, 14 different museums there. You got what trains and logging and trucking and the fire uh, fire trucks and literally everything. Um, and you mentioned you're a volunteer there now. I'm just curious, how did that get started? What, what got you volunteering there? I can't remember who told me about it in the first place. Um, it, it did all of it started for the truck museum side. That was first before the fire museum. Mm -hmm. Um, I went in there, it must've been during the steam up. So the steam up is, is the, the big event that they do last weekend in July, first weekend in August. Um, and that event is, is everything's open. All 14 museums are open and uh, we had 15,000 people come this year. So it's a pretty big event. They constantly win the best event in, in Oregon for families. Yep. And, yep. and I saw the simulator that was over there. And I mean, I couldn't see like the pixelation was so bad. And this I'm like, this will not stand. I'm actually trying to figure out how this is all set up because I didn't build it. Um, and so uh, there's gauges and controls, you know, obviously most of this doesn't work. Uh, it's pretty cool the way that um, these are set up is that when you press the brake, it actually puts air 
um, into the um, cab and presses it up using pneumatic pressure. So that's uh, pretty exciting. And then I figured out that this is set up to a very old 1994 thrust master uh, steering wheel. So we're going to see if that can work. Uh, we're also going to see if this can get connected as well because it almost feels like it's connected down here into something and it's been modified. Uh, over here, that's the old computer. Um, that is a Windows XP era computer that runs a really old simulator. It's just not keeping up. And then uh, this screen right here. Um, this screen is modern, but it runs through S-Video and there's a weird splitter that is just really bad quality. So uh, we have this, which was donated to um, us. Uh, this is a newer Dell. It's got a lot of RAM in it. Uh, it does not have a dedicated graphics card, but we're running American Truck Simulator. Um, and which want, runs just fine on the Intel graphics chip that's in there. So uh, we're going to hook all this up and I'm going to be using this to see if I can adapt the old Thrustmaster joystick port to USB and we're going to see if this works. All right, so we're replacing this screen, which is really cool. Yeah, so uh, I was actually able to get this to talk using that controller, which is exciting. So uh, this is going to run off a, a different type of video port. Um, because this actually has two outputs at the back of it and yeah, we're gonna see if we can get the configuration all set and this was like right before this I think this this was probably 2019 um, So I've been living down in the valley for uh, for a little bit I went with my brother and I'm like this. This is just not happening So over the course between the um, now and then so it took more than three years to do this I just asked I'm like, can I can I work on this and they're like Sure. Why did it, it hurt? It was, it was running Windows XP, and I don't think that that was the original setup. But the heart, like the, the steering input, was literally rubber um, uh, bungee cords. Bungee so cords. you had like ninety degrees of steering input, and I'm like, this is just not happening. All right. So down here, we uh, this is not the best job in the world, but um, these are actually probably going to need to be replaced. I just have them kind of zip tied. This is um, how we're doing the force feedback for now. Um, and it's because anything more than about this, um, the, the old, sc old school steering wheel doesn't really like. But the cool thing is, is um, this pedal does work. And when you press this, you hear that? You got some pneumatic pressure, which is pretty cool. So, yeah, that's what we got. And so now I'm going to learn how to play American Truck Simulator. And uh, it's going to be lots of fun. All right, here we have the gameplay. So uh, that seems to be working pretty well. Uh, I have it set in completely automatic mode where it's just, you know, acceleration pedals forward and then um, when you press on the brakes um, it'll slow down and then if you press it hard enough it'll start to go in reverse um, and then if you press it really hard that's when the hydraulics come in it's pretty cool so yeah uh, pretty happy with how this turned out there's a lot of things you can do with this game um, including getting a functional shifter so um, I think eventually I'm going to replace this entire setup just because um, I think we can get it a lot more realistic um, if we use a different game controller, but, um, maybe next summer when I can work on that and <laughs> love how I'm just kind of pulling out into traffic. <laughs> oh, yep. Just definitely <laughs> hit a car. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I don't know really <laughs> where I'm driving whatsoever. There's actually a GPS over there that tells me I'm, I think I'm going the wrong way. Oh, this is <laughs> steering is a little sensitive. And so. You know, I, I started taking it apart and then it kept getting kept getting worse for a little bit. But at the same time, because of the way that the show season is and the truck museum, most Saturdays between what, May and October, if you go to the truck museum on a Saturday or Sunday, somebody's there. Even like I think it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, somebody's there. They have an awesome, very dedicated volunteer um, group yeah. of, of individuals that will walk around 80 trucks. It's just a beautiful facility. And we're very blessed as a fire museum to be across from them. Yeah. Um, and so I, I saw that simulator and that's the thing where I'm like, you know, what? I have no business doing anything with trucks, but I'm a pretty techie guy. I mean, this, this, uh, that I built over my garage is my play space for all the technology. I mean, I have things that are literally like, oh, here's a computer that's in pieces. Just, to, you know, I remember, I remember you fixing iPhones and other random stuff in college as a side, side gig. <laughs> random iPhones, like random people. Yeah. So. Um, anyone who has uh, any sort of cleanliness of, or sorry, organization, I'm I, cleanliness, organization uh, would probably come in here and be like, nope, and just leave. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why I built this over my garage. It's an outbuilding. It's disconnected from the house. It's because it just gets to be a little messy. Well, I'm sorry. 
So, um, so that's the, that's the truck museum. The truck museum also has the uh, the Brooks Truck Show. So Brooks, Oregon, is the is the small town just on the north side of Salem, and uh, they've been doing it. This was the 30th anniversary that they did it. So that's also a very large event, and they consistently had growing amounts of semi uh, semi trucks that were there, just trucks in general that were registered. And I want to say at final count, um, we blew the record out of the water this year at 444 registered trucks. Um, yeah. And I mean, there's a huge field that they use and, and there's just trucks and just keeps going. And then it's not as big as the steam up, but it's still a huge, huge event. It's still the biggest truck show, I believe, in Oregon. Um, oh, yeah. I've been I've been doing it a couple of times, you know, being in the industry for a while now. And so, yeah, I've been there many times and uh, it's a lot of fun. I mean, they have the night glow, uh, which is always fun as well. Seeing all the trucks lit up at night and man. Oh, yeah. I, and I always miss that this year I was going to go, but I started volunteering at like seven 30 in the morning that day. And I'm like, I want to see my kids. Like that's one of my goals <laughs> as a dad is I, I, and yep. I know that this, this must be a, a, a struggle for some people in the trucking industry is that I don't want to go a day without seeing my kids. And so, I mean, if you're a, you know, long hauler, I mean, there are days that you probably don't see your family. And I, I mean, oh, my yeah. heart goes out to folks that do that. It's because stuff needs to move. And yeah. that stuff that needs to move, well, it turns out there are humans that make that happen, which is a, which is a, I mean, my heart goes out and some people really enjoy it. And there, there's something to be said about like, I'm going to go work, get my work done. And then I get my time off to be with my family during the day. There, there's, there's stuff to be said about that, of course, but my heart, my heart goes out as a father to other fathers that are working through that. Um, but, and then, so with the fire museum, there was a, a friend of mine who he had a couple of fire trucks. And those fire trucks were uh, belong to an organization, and unfortunately, my my friend passed away. And the organization was, um, mm, how can I say this in a way that is recorded? Um, the organization was not in. Mm, organization needed to have some paperwork updated. Sure. And so, in the process of having that paperwork updated. There were other board members and they were still able to meet quorum uh, to be able to go through the process of um, making sure the paperwork was in order because the organization owned these fire trucks that my that my buddy Mike just absolutely loved. And they went through the process of getting things in in right standing and everything that they needed to do. And we went through all of the process, um, we meaning them, and I was just on the sidelines just making sure that we were updated because one of the things Mike wanted to do was to leave them to the museum. And right. so in the process of doing all of this, the museum was like, so you've been super involved with us now for months getting this done. Uh, do you want to become a board member? I'm like, okay. Um, and so um, I was That's taking cool. care of these two apparatus that he had, which is a uh, engine 51 and squad 51 replica or look alike from the show emergency from the 1980s. Um, those are really good YouTube videos. If you want to put them there and, Yep. And they're really, really awesome. Again, I have no business working on either of them, but my job was to keep them running because Mike was in a wheelchair. He couldn't keep them running on his own. Right. Um, so we still have them. Uh, they're they're getting sold. They're actually going to auction. Um, we're going to be putting them on like bring a trailer or something like that coming up um, because we we talked with the family and it's it's closing a long chapter um, for for us and it's helping fund our phase two of our building project. So that's how I got involved with all of the stuff. That's awesome. So, so back to the truck simulator. So this thing's been sitting there for a while. Uh, and, and so actually how, how did it first get to the museum? Did they tell you about that? I actually don't know the whole story, but based on uh, just comments that I've received on the channel and then actually, did you know Robbie Simpson from Oregon state? Um, uh, he rings a bell. Yeah. He, so he was one year after when, when we were all together in Weatherford. Yep. His boss apparently knows about the simulator, and it was actually a simulator that was at Freightliner. Okay. And I don't, I don't know if the iteration when I found it was the same iteration. It very well could have been because it was running. It was a very old machine running Windows XP, and like hard. It was running it hard, and so <laughs> I, I don't know how it got got there beyond we're done with the simulator. What do you want to do with it? Hey, we're a truck right. museum. We're allowed to take it, and we have the space for it. So that's that's my understanding of it and it's i mean it was it looks like it was built for, by somebody who really knew what they were doing um and the cool thing is that it ha it has had has 
Um, there's a, a air compressor in the back that when you press the brake pedal, it actually moves the cab, which is really cool. And I actually yeah. figured out how to disconnect that from the original system because I've redone everything now and how to get it retrofitted into the new system. It's not complete yet, but I know how to do it. And I found the actual switch and the wiring to be able to do it, which is really good. Um, so, but it was yeah. really, really old when I found it. And walk through, what were some of the headaches? Uh, what were the things that you had to fix at the beginning? Uh, you know, from where it was earlier to how it is now, walk through that whole process. Yeah. So, so I mentioned that the, um, the steering was just, was just wacky because there were two bungee cords that were holding it in place. That was, that was it is because there's no force feedback. I was running a thrush master two, which was modern in like 1994. Um, so that you didn't really get that much turning radius as it was. Um, and then the pixelation, I mean, that was, that was actually the complaint when I was talking about it, it, they were talking about with me is that the pixelation was just so bad. The monitor is like a, it's like a Samsung TV. It's a 1080p TV. And it was hooked up to this old computer running some, you know, VGA converted signal and you couldn't see anything. And so trying to navigate through windows to even open the game up was just impossible. And so um, once you're in the game, it you know would, would change. I, I think it ran at like 640, like it was 640 by 40, like it really low resolution. So then I'm like, we're just gonna get a new computer. So then when I did that, I had to figure out how to get this super old thrust master to work. Cause I'm like one step at a time. And <laughs> I actually found an old MIDI port. Remember MIDI or game ports? Joystick Man, yeah. Yep. Uh, I found an old converter um, that's, that still worked. So t adapted that to USB, which works. And wow. I was like, we're going to do American Truck Simulator. It, it, it is the industry standard, it seems like, for, for all yep. of this. It's really inexpensive. And it seems like it's lots of fun. So I got that. And, it, and I had some random Dell computer that was donated to my own nonprofit. Um, and so we were able to, it's a, you know, educational venture. So we donated it to the museum and I, I mean, it runs onboard graphics still, which is limiting, but it has a decent processor. I put as much Ram as I had lying around in it. And from a performance point of view, I can run it on medium graphics and it's fine. Yep. Then, then I don't know. I, I, I was like, I'm still not happy with this is because the steering was just so wacky is because turn to turn in a, in a big truck is like what, five, six rotations. And yeah, and this is, you're getting 90 degrees. So when you turn the steering wheel 30 degrees on the, you could see it spinning and spinning and spinning. And so it was just really hard to drive no matter what I did. Right. I couldn't, I couldn't really turn down the sensitivity enough. So then I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. And this is, this has taken me you know, about a year and a half to do this. Um, I removed the whole bungee cord setup. I actually removed all of the, ev everything. I got it down to basis and, um, I bought fa a Fanatec setup. It's called a DD 42, which yeah. is for like driving simulation. And I actually had built a flight simulator in the meantime. So I had a kind of a better idea about how this, all of this interfaced, but that I had to figure out very creatively about how to mount that. And so I took, I took part, most of the hard work from the person that originally built it. Um, right. I put a Fanatec um, pedal setup. So if I want to add a clutch pedal later, I can do it. If I want to add um, an actual stick for a stick shift that works, um, I can do it. So now that it's in the Fanatec family, the thing that's probably limiting now is the actual um, American Truck Simulator game. Because if you like crash or if you need to reset something, it's not like Cruising USA that you just kind of right. reset. So that's actually the biggest challenge right now getting ready for their truck show. And over here, found the keys. And I'm gonna walk over here to this simulator. Look at this, this is all mounted and exactly, well, that's not mounted. This is mounted exactly where it needs to be. And look at that, it is solid as a freaking rock. That is going to be absolutely amazing. So what I need to do today is I need to get this mounted down and then we should be all ready to go. I'm gonna plug it in, boom. That's fun. All right, here we go. So I'm not the world's best uh, truck driver, but, and yes, I know the steering wheel is exactly 180 out. Is figuring out a better ecosystem because during during the year or when there's like group, small groups that are coming or whatever, if someone wants right. to go and play for half an hour, that's great. But during like the steam up in the truck show, that'd be hectic because by the time yeah, somebody comes in, made their profile, 
So um, I'm thinking about going to 18 Wheeler Holland, which is like modern from like 2004 and try right. and, and running that. Um, I also, there's a company here in Corvallis that um, is called tracker IR. That's a head tracker um, yeah. that I'm so close to getting that to work. I ran out of time. We all ran out of time before the truck show. I, they generously donated it to us. And it's really cool. Cause like I get sick um, using like VR. Yeah. So not having those goggles on, but still being able to move, especially in a truck simulator to be able to like check your mirrors and look down the street before you go into the street is a huge asset. And I just, I couldn't get it dialed in, in time. And that was, I just, I ran out of time. You know, I, yep. I go there after my board meetings for half an hour at a time. I went up there for a couple of hours to try to get it to work. And I, the computer ended up when I connected to the internet to download the track IR software, it said, by the way, here are two years worth of updates that you haven't updated. Yeah, of course. <laughs> whatever, because it's not connected to the internet out there. So that's kind of that's kind of where we're at is that um, I'm looking for a new piece of software. So anyone listening to this that has a recommendation of something that's just very easy, that's fast to go go through, we're going to leave American Truck Simulator on there because why not? Uh, I'm going to be updating the computer and the graphics card eventually at some point, but I'm really looking for a very easy software for primarily kids to be able to just come in and go have fun. And then anyone who really wants to have fun will, will come back later when, you know, on a regular weekend when there's not a big event coming and they can, they can have fun in American Truck Simulator. So did you ever play American Truck Simulator before this whole project? Nope. I'm not much of a gamer whatsoever. I don't. <laughs> I didn't any. think so. And how about, how about now? Do you feel like you uh, can, can handle it relatively okay? <laughs> I mean, I, I can handle it now that I've been through all of it. Um, and I've been researching about how to get the physical buttons in the cab to work. Right. And at, and that game, it, honestly, well, it helps me build a huge appreciation for truckers because of all the things that you have to remember. And American Truck Simulator, for their credit, is really great because like if you they leave- do a good job. Well, if you leave your trailer down, like it'll drag and, and then like it puts stress on your engine. Or if you leave, you know, your, um, your engine brake on, like things like that, or like it'll damage your engine and you have to get towed back to service. And then that costs yep. you $500 out of your till and like things like that. I'm like, so, so that's really cool because the realistics helped me learn about this stuff and the incredible realism that can be put into games. Totally. But at the same time, that, that's also a thorn in my side because, you know, eight-year-olds not going to want to care about any of that. They just want to be able to drive in a full-size truck simulator. Exactly. So I, I am curious. So others have gone in, uh, tested out your uh, where it's at now. What, what have people thought? Um, some have thought that it is, it is too complicated. Okay. All right. We have the crew here and the first willing participant, very willing participant. Hey, it's not that. Keep going, keep going, keep going. It's got a dead zone. Oh, dead zone? Uh, it, that's, it, that's a pretty big difference. Now, round two. We're all very excited about this, right? There we go. Okay. So I have the steering sensitivity set oh. to pretty high. Oh, yeah, you do. Yep. So, but the way that this is, is uh, you can look at both of your mirrors. You're in 16th gear. There you go. Oh, there we go. Proper proper signal indication. There we go. Wonderful. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, we are. Slow it down, Diana. There, there we go. 31 miles an hour. Awesome. There we go. And we can watch all of it from the outside. Okay which is very exciting. <laughs> we can still hear the screams from out here. And we can watch from the outside, watch from the inside. So it's gonna tell you to, oh, oh yeah. Oh, it told me to go up there and I yep. failed. Because there's the GPS right over there. Okay. Oh, I didn't understand. That's okay. I've turned off uh, truck damage. <laughs> um, it's like, it's way too complicated, but I have had a couple of youths get in it. And once I've set it up, and they're like, this is amazing. Like just, just a couple of beta testers, like right before the truck show. And that's kind of where we made the call where it's like, unless I'm there resetting it every single time, it's just kind of a pain in the butt to be able to do it. But the, um, I had a younger kid and then I had a, um, a college age student that they're like, this is amazing. I, yeah. The college student actually, uh, his name's Caden. Um, Caden, he knows how to back up stuff because his family has boats. And so he's in this thing and, and this level started out where you have to get out of this really tight warehouse. And I'm just kind of like, I love truckers because they'll be able to, you know, take their truck and be able to do crazy things with them. I'm like, I'm yeah. out. And Tate yep. is like, you know, in the game, he's like scraping up against it or whatever. He's like, oh yeah. And you know, opposite lock, opposite lock. And he's just, and I'm like, this is, a, this is amazing. And this is wonderful. And he got out of there in, you know, 45 seconds and it would take me like 10 minutes. 
um, so again, it, it's amazing because again, it's so it's realistic and it works. The DD42 works really well. Um, the the way that I have it set up right now is it's in simple automatic mode, which means that the brake pedal is the, is reverse and the accelerator right. pedal is forward. Again, for kids, um, I probably want to change it to just probably standard automatic, but I would want to have one of the switches on the dash or something um, to be able to switch between because having to figure out, okay, do you put it in D, you know, do you put it in R and stuff like that, I think is just going to confuse people. Or eventually there is a, a an Eaton, um, you know, I think it's a 10 or 13 speed that's in there. I just think that'd be amazing to get that to work and get a clutch pedal in there would just be awesome. So the game, obviously you can do so much. Um, and well, it's actually pretty interesting because you mentioned, you know, these younger, younger people can get on it, get the feel for it. Uh, it, it the realism is there. There's actually, and I'm going to tap into your marketing brain here a little bit. So as a marketing expert, the trucking industry is trying to figure out ways to hire new truck drivers and get more people into the trucking industry. Um, just a little bit of background. The American Trucking Association says that we're short 60, 80,000 truck drivers with a truck driver shortage. Others argue that it's just a turnover issue, but basically we don't have enough quality truckers on the road uh, for a lot of these companies sticking around. And so one company, Schneider, big company, they are advertising on like the billboards inside American Truck Simulator, trying to inspire these gamers to, hey, join the trucking industry, do this in real life. Uh, the goal of the game, very self-explanatory, uh, what you'd expect realistically simulates the experience of being a truck driver in America. Players take on jobs that make deliveries across the country. Um, and one real life trucking company is hoping those in-game skills translate to the real world, Snyder National recently released advertisements uh, that appear on billboards in this game. The virtual ads aiming to entice gamers to join the company as real world truck drivers. All this because right now there is a shortage, about 80,000 truck drivers uh, short, shy. Uh, according to the American Truck Driving Association, that number has remained roughly the same, but experts saying it, it's not moving in a good direction, forcing these truck companies to get creative. And I'm just curious, from a, from a gaming perspective to an advertising perspective, do you think that's a good idea? Yeah. I, 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 hiring and firing is extremely expensive. Yeah. And I think that there is a, a lot better awareness over the last decade of we are short truck drivers. Yeah. And I was extremely encouraged to see how many drivers, because I worked the till on Friday at the truck show how many dri drivers that came in were, were young where I'm like, Ooh, you are, you are young. And that is a big truck. And they're like, I got this, like, and just yep. cruising in. Um, I think from, from my understanding, there's, um, especially with smaller companies, there's some really good, uh, family friendly approach to work, working in a smaller truck or trucking company of, um, there's a lot of mentorship. I think that that's something yeah. that really resonates totally. with Gen Z and millennials is having somebody that's that's there for you and you know love or hate the terminology a little bit of the hand holding throughout the way um and that's why i love living in a small town is because you have those connections and i think yeah. that if you have that, those connections and that exposure and you really have a family um working together there are a lot of family owned trucking companies that i a lot of a lot of those companies are in we're at the truck show and it was really cool to see that and just kind of casually talking with people, um, a couple of the trucks are like, how'd you get into it? It's like a friend of a friend of a friend. Yep. And then and then they feel like, you know, there's like the, a buy-in to that because it's like, I feel like I'm a part of something. Um, you know, there, there's a, there's an organization called Dozer Days from the Netter Foundation that they do um, these events for kids that they just have heavy machinery that's out at the Lane County Fairgrounds and they pop kids on these tractors and let them play around with it. And they really try to emphasize like, you know, all the companies that are there, we enjoy being a part of this. It's a lot of fun and you get to play with what you did with a kid yeah. in real life. It's the same sort of thing. Um, I, I think that that's really smart. I think that having a multi-tiered approach, I probably wouldn't put all my money on running games, you know, ad, ads inside of games. But if you get some turnover and what you can do is that you can, you can measure that, you know, from a digital marketing point of view, you can measure right. those efforts. So um, a lot easier. Um, I think that the, the community oriented focus 
and then having events and getting people out. I think that's really helpful. There, there is a lot of, you know, even though I'm a college instructor, my, my personal philosophy is that it's not for everybody. It really isn't for everybody. And there are a lot of places that have done disservice to, to students saying that you have to go to college or else. I'm a mentor with my students, so I can tell them realistically about doing that. And there's the financial literacy point of view. So I, I have heard in other industries as well is it's not only finding someone who is willing to build that skill set, but it's the, okay, now that you're in that skill set, it's all of the other things that are going on in your life. Because if those things are not managed in your life, like financial literacy, yep. you're probably, it's probably going to detract you from being a good trucker if you don't know how to balance your budget because you have yeah. a $70,000 oh, truck at extremely. home. Extremely. And so um, I know that in the fire service that that's, that's something that, you know, we need firefighters as well. Yeah. And it's, it's, that's, there are incredible programs. I want to give a shout out to us, uh, Black Butte Ranch. If you ever went there, um, they have, they have this really awesome uh, cadet program that if you're going to get a fire science degree, you get to go and work there and you get to work shifts and it's just that's cool. amazingly practical. Um, there's, uh, I wrote, there's, I, or, sorry. Oh, I wrote an article on our, uh, on our CDL school page and it was about, I mean, so, so fire truck, uh, the truck drivers, uh, the, the fire truck drivers themselves, that's a whole, like, it's the older guys and they're the ones that are like retiring, you know, whether it's health reasons or whatnot. And there's not enough experience of people driving these trucks, not just getting firefighters, but like fire truck drivers. And, uh, and so I wrote a whole article, like, mm, if you're looking at doing it, maybe get some CDL experience, get your CDL and you know, then you're used to, you don't have to, but, uh, you know, get some experience of driving something big. So you can, if you're going to, if you want to volunteer as a volunteer truck dr or a volunteer firefighter or join the firefighting industry, then you have some driving experience and you can help out there as well. But, you know, yeah. And, and that's, again, here's my plug. If you live anywhere near a district that has uh, volunteers needed, almost every single district across the country yep. needs volunteer firefighters. And that is a very good role that you can do, especially if you like to drive big things, is yeah. that you, you don't necessarily have to be or get to be in some cases, the person that kicks down the door and goes in there and pulls people up. I mean, there, there's an incredible amount of training that, that gets there. But think about the people that need, you're watching the pump to make sure that you're not garbooning your pump you need there's a, a, a grass fire on fourth of july actually that my favorite fire truck tender 11 was out there because they were you know a mile and a half away from the nearest hydrant and there needed to be volunteers to go drive code three to the hydrant fill it up and go back and forth and not be an idiot and have yep. and can you imagine if, you know people that have cdl experience it's like oh well we can do this all all day long if we need to yeah um, but I, I mean, the districts that were the volunteer districts that were all called in to help three of, of the four of them off the top of my head were there to help the professional, the, um, they're all professionals, uh, but the, the paid districts from like Albany was there and to right. take care of all of it. So th there are ways to get involved that you don't have to go and commit your entire life to it. It's, it's just one of those things that you can do for your community. It's really helpful. And a lot of it does come down to driving. And the right. precision that, that requires to be able to get into a big vehicle like that, because I'm sure a lot of people listening to this, especially truckers know, drivers are idiots. Just in general, the average oh, yeah. every driver that's on the road and make all the jokes you want about Oregonian drivers, at, at least the, the majority of us are extremely courteous. So you you hit on those, those lights, woo, and people will get out of the way, almost like aggressively so in most cases, which is great. Yeah. But for trucks... Slow drivers in Oregon, I'm sure, drive truck drivers absolutely batty. It's because you have speed limiters on, you're you're just under 80,000 pounds, and you got that that hill that's coming up. And then the Prius decides to get out of the fast lane. Finally, it's because somebody was riding them a little bit too close in their bumper, and now they're doing 54 miles an hour in front of you. Yep. Like it's like it's like how do you how do you manage that? Uh, well, with, with good experience to realize, okay, this is what needs to happen. And this is what's being you know, data logged and all that stuff. There's so many things that are going on. And so I think that that does highlight the need for the decisions that need to be made by humans, that if things are, if, are, are so calculated out on big, you know, long haul things, I guess 
that's that's a whole nother a whole nother rabbit trail. But I think that it really highlights the importance of the human decisions and the empathetic decisions that need to be made by humans in a lot of those situations. Totally, totally. Um, so we're getting close to the end of our time, but I do uh, had a couple questions again with your business entrepreneurship mindset. A lot of these truckers, they get a couple of years of experience and they think, hey, I can go on my own, start become an owner operator, start their own business, maybe grow their own fleet eventually. Uh, but they're basically entrepreneurs themselves. And we all know if you're starting a new business, any business, uh, the, the, after the first year of still being around, it's very, very high failure rate. I am curious what you teach uh, or, you know, what's your mindset for entrepreneurships? What's the skills? What's the mindset you need to think about? A lot of it has to do with the role of hustle and, oh, yeah. and, and really getting down to your philosophy for why you, you want to do why you want to do. Um, you know, a lot of students are in my classes and they really don't know what they want to do. They might say that they do, but they really don't. And it's like, why are you spending tens of thousands of dollars to go do this? And so we, we really, and this sounds super Simon Sinek, you do start with the why. Once you understand that and really what, what makes that tick and life does change. You know, the, the reason why I teach and the reason why I own my business, those are definitely changed over, over the years. Yep. Um, and now it's, it's all, it's all mentorship focused and focused on, on my family and then really, you know, building other people up. That's really what, what I want to be able to do with either being a business coach or as someone who volunteers for nonprofits. So we really start there is if you want to go out and your goal is just to make gobs and gobs of money, I think that that's, I think that that's going to be apparent for some people. It's going to be more apparent for some people. They might be um, better to hide it, whether that's intentional or unintentional. But if, if that's your whole goal is just to make gobs and gobs of money, well, that, that really transcends into a lot of different ways um, that businesses are run. And you can, there's, there's nothing wrong with making a lot of money. Some of the wealthiest people that I know are the most humble down to earth people. And the reason, I mean, they wanted to go make money and they understood that the people that they needed to surround themselves along the way, including people that worked for them, that they had to value those people. And so right. that is, that is a huge highlight right now is if you want to go out on your own, especially hiring other people, that is going to be probably the most difficult thing is to hire people. Um, there's, there's a sweet spot in a lot of industries and I, you know, I can't speak to the trucking industry because I'm a noob about it, but there's a sweet spot where if you do, um, you, you are in your own business and it's just you and maybe you and a business partner, that sort of small business like that, you can make enough to, to, to make a good amount of money. Stepping from that into owning a fleet with several people who are working for you into a lot of money, that's a huge step. So one of the things that we talk about is like, you know, if you do make $150,000 a year, are, are you going to be content with that? And you don't really know about it, but it's a good check to be like, at what point are you going to be okay? Because it really is a never ending stream of you get the nicer house, you get the nicer car. Well, if you're going to have a car payment for the rest of your life, it's like those things are going to be depreciated assets. Is, is that something that you really want to do? Right. Um, so, and these are all questions that we ask um, that we ask my students. And some of my students are just like, yeah, well, yeah, I want to I want to go lease a Maserati so I don't have to deal with the, the maintenance in the long run. I want to get a new Maserati every three years and have eight hundred, nine hundred dollars a month. And that's kind of how I want to do. Um, OK, that's fine. But we really do start with with that. Why? And yeah. then um, joining in community is is like one of the, one of the best ways to get connected totally. to marketing research. So, again, if you're in Oregon, come to the truck museum. I mean, there, there's a lot of uh, retired truckers and, and owner operators and. A lot of really great folks that volunteer there. It's a great, great thing to to talk with them. Go to the truck show. Join your local chamber of commerce is a really great way. You know, do some job shadowing um, of, of truck company. A lot of the stuff that we talk about with all of our students. I think that those are the things to be like. Can you see yourself doing this? And may, maybe it is you do want to do the long haul trucking because there's you know good money in that. Maybe that's something you do want to do. And maybe you want to do you know your home every night. Maybe you, there's other type of specialty trucking that you can do. And so really getting a breadth of understanding before hopping into that, where you see the glimmer in your eye. And I know it's cool to own your own stuff, to be like, this is my trucking company. My name is on it. 
company names on it. That's really cool, but really have some planning involved. You do not have to have a 500 page sexy business plan to get right. going. You, you really don't, don't need all of that stuff. You need to have a couple of pages with some projections and like a marketing plan that has, you know, a page in Google Docs about it because all of that stuff will change the moment you press that start button on that There's business. Like, yep. But really understanding the philosophy because you, if you go and then you you know invested hundred thousand dollars into a tr tracking business, I mean that's going to go like a flash. And then what if you don't really know where you're going? I think um, so. I mean sometimes life happens and then you you have to change plans. But if you have no plan in the first place, you have nothing to fall back on. Um, there's a really good book called The Startup of You. It's what we teach in the first year at Oregon State University. And it's really good. It talks a lot about this stuff. So actually, this is, leads right into exactly what I started. I, I created a seven-part trucking startup roadmap series of everything from pre-planning all the way to being a successful uh, at year three. So this, this comes down to your business plan your expectations, uh, doing research. And like you said, um, you know, finding mentors, uh, you know, the other thing in Oregon is the Oregon trucking association, any trucking association, the PMTA here in Pennsylvania, get involved, ask around. If you know people ask questions, because honestly, you know, a lot of the issues we see with new, with new owner operators is, Hey, I've been driving truck for this company they're getting loads. I can, I can probably find some loads and, and I can do that, but then they don't realize trucking insurance is ex extremely expensive. If they did any kind of market research, they realized that uh, we're in a freight recession and have been for a year now. And while we are at all time lows, we might be coming back out. So it might be a good time to think about coming in, but, but insurance is expensive. Uh, you know, so with insurance, what is, what is your safety history look like? So that could be, have you had personal car accidents, speeding tickets? Uh, what are your financial, uh, are you paying down loans or what's your um, you know, credit score look like? And things that you probably didn't realize you needed to do, you need a year or two to plan before owning your own business with a lot of these other things along the way. And then it's DOT compliance, safety, driver files, drug testing, and then it's finding loads, uh, getting relationships with shippers, and, and there's direct freight, or there's the load boards that are sort of doing the, the quick, finding quick loads, but then they're crappy. Uh, there's, there's so much involved in the trucking industry. Uh, so for if you're wanting to join, check out our whole playlist there where we cover all of that, over an hour and a half of uh, great content. All right, well, to be respectful to your time, I see the sun coming up behind you. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, uh, I just wanted to, you know, so you have the uh, channel uh, Bad Ideas Garage. What's, what's next up there? So uh, the, the Z26 Chevy Beretta, uh, it's been sitting for a couple of years. Um, there is a, there's a, um, an auction website called Cars and Bids by a YouTuber named Doug DeMiro. There's this weird plug. I've been trying to get a car nice enough to be able to post on that because they do weird but nice stuff from the, the 1980s and up this is weird and funky but it has really low miles on it and it's also it's been sitting for a bit so um there's a guy here who's gonna he he his, he's been detailing for like 55 years or something like that um and uh he, he's actually from um fort benning area oh yeah yeah around there yeah so uh uh a georgia connection I was born in Fort Benning, so. Yep, yep, I, I remember that. Um, and then there's um, there's another company here that I really want to bless with. You know, they'll go through the process of changing all the fluids, and then my job is to is to go through. This is a very light project to just to do the marketing part of it, do a review of it. So it's a very very light project before school starts. Um, the Hyundai Ionic Six. So I should be filming that today, and it usually takes me a couple of weeks to be able to get a video out, um, just with kids and everything. Um, so I'll be doing a review. So there's a project, very light project, but then there's a review. Um, and then the, uh, the Rivian SUV. So a, a friend of mine yeah. is going to let me do a review of that. So that's coming up. Um, and then more stuff, fire truck stuff, a lot of fire trucks. Um, there's actually a, a gentleman in Illinois that owns a trucking company, uh, who wanted to buy one of our fire trucks because it's a Freightliner fire truck. And it's a very, very rare one. 
and awesome. um, he wants he wants to bless the museum and he is a huge freightliner guy so he um, I want to do a video on that um, one of our 19 our 1950 Kenworth water tanker uh, has an 18 Ooh. liter v12 so getting that running um, that's going to be coming up which is going to be fun I never got to the Subaru Jesty this summer so that's probably going to be put off for a little bit um, and if I'm crazy enough <laughs> there, there's there's a couple of Subaru XTs that are not far from here, and one of them I might I might do a rest, restoration on it. It's it's just not worth a lot, and mine is like I my goal is to basically break even on every single car. I want cars to get back on the road. That's it. Right. I want the car to get in a, in a good enough condition that someone's going to get it on the road. It's probably still going to have a couple things it needs. But I just I don't want things to sit. That's really my my whole goal in it. And there's an '88 Subaru XT6 that needs a radiator, that I really want to do that. And it's just a weird funky car. I'll send you a picture of it. And then there's a silver one that I probably shouldn't touch at all. Um, that yes. one's in pieces. So those are kind of the things that that we have coming up. But um, a lot of stuff with the with the fire museum for sure. Awesome. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Uh, for those watching, go like, subscribe at Bad Ideas Garage there on YouTube. Uh, if you haven't already, like and subscribe for our YouTube channel as well for CNS uh, and our podcast, Caution Wide Right. A lot of more stuff coming. We do two a month. And like we mentioned, we've got other videos where we talk about how to start up a business uh, to so much more. Um, so a lot to, lot to look at, a lot to, per to peruse. Uh, but again, Stephen, thank you for joining me today. And uh, good luck on those fun, uh, uh, fun projects, and we'll be staying tuned. <laughs> Again, if you have any questions, uh, fill out the form linked below in our bio where you can learn about join, be, wanting to become a truck driver, DOT regulations, CNS in, uh, insurance, uh, trucking insurance, whatever it is. Fill out the form below. And again, like, subscribe, and feel free to call or email us as well. And as always, stay safe out there. <laughs>